Ladies and gentlemen, uh, in the Thank world you. of revolution, thank you so much for joining us. Today, we have a gentleman that uh, we will be interviewing together. And when I say we, I mean uh, Ania, who is our editor based in Hong Kong, and Summit, who is our editor based here in Singapore, because uh, such is the magnitude of his collection, such is the insight and depth of his ability of discernment that I think it is not possible for just one person to interview him. And so we have put together a team. And each of us will be taking a part of this interview. And that gentleman is Ronnie Madvani, who is, uh, I mean, a collector beyond uh, the majority of the rest of the world. Uh, I think his insight into elegance, his capacity to understand style, and its, its, uh, its expression through beautiful case design, through beautiful lug design, uh, through, through, through sheer elegance is unparalleled. So without uh, any further ado, Ronnie, how are you, sir? I'm good. First of all, thank you so much for all of you guys for having me here. I'm honored and I'm, I'm so humbled. I don't think I deserve uh, the description you gave, but uh, I'm honored and humbled nevertheless. Thank you. You know what I love about um, looking, for example, your Instagram feed is that I think that, you know, watch collecting has become a very popular hobby, especially in the last couple of years. But I think that there, there is um, a, a sometimes, I wouldn't say a trend, but a, 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 a a capacity for people to all be sort of very focused on the same things, right? And I think we know what those are, certain, certain references from certain brands. And when you go into your Instagram feed, suddenly it's like the world is opening and you're seeing so many things from different eras which uh, display such beautiful creativity and artistry. Um, and it just makes me feel inspired as someone that loves watches. So we're going to um, talk about watches in, in three different segments. Nia is going to talk about uh, Gilbert Albert, uh, which uh, I know is someone who is very, very close to your heart and of the watches that you have um, created by him. And uh, also of the beautiful shaped watches that you have been such a great communicator of. Then uh, Summit is going to talk to you a little bit about your Patek Philippe chronographs, um, which are also extraordinary watches. And I'm going to talk to you about your Cartier collection. In particular, uh, your I think it's probably the world's most famous crash and your two Tonsin Clays, which are also probably two of the world's most famous Tonsin Clays as well. But uh, I'm going to turn it over to Niha. Uh, please get started. So Niha, please take it away. Yeah, Ronnie. So as we mentioned, what makes your collection truly exceptional is your focus on form, elegance and style in watchmaking, uh, particularly from the 1950s. And uh, you started your your essential collection started with um, the Patek Philippe reference three four two four designed by Gilbert Albert. I believe that was your first Patek. So tell us, do you have them all by now, including the most fascinating three four one two, or are you missing one or two still in in that collection, particularly in relation with Gilbert Albert? Well, I think with all us watch collectors, it's a never ending sort of paradigm, really. I mean, you know, you want you have one in yellow gold and then you see one in rose gold and you see one in white gold and you want that and that. Unfortunately, by the affordability of what I can actually afford. So that, that sort of controls me uh, rather than mortgage my house and go into debt. But uh, in terms of what do I have within that sort of deck of cards of Jababa, um, there's the one. Uh, that's missing the three, four, one, two, which is, probably sounds nuts to everyone. All these reference numbers and stuff, but again, it's a crazy shaped uh, watch, and yeah, um, I'm looking for. I've been looking for it. Uh, I don't know for ten, fifteen years, and it obviously it has come up at auction, but it was beyond my means. So I'm waiting to get uh, at the right price. Uh, you know, the way I, I rationalize to myself and make myself happy is it'll come up, and uh, I, I probably won't come up ever at the right price, but. Uh, I don't know, maybe I'll win the lottery or go to Vegas and win something too. <laughs> <laughs> so out, out of the ones that you have, which is which which is the one you wear most often and which is which is the one that that's been your favorite so far? Uh, probably the, the the first one I got, which is the three four two four. Um, mm -hmm. I, yeah, so yeah, it's the most elegant I, I, I think and the most practical to wear and stuff. Yeah, so that, that's the one I enjoy I, wearing the most. I, I believe you've kept some watches out for us to um, see also. Yes, I've kept the whole, uh, it's probably be sort of grainy and stuff. I, I don't know how, do I lift the computer up and show or uh, I, don't, I don't know how that works. I, oh, I can show you the watches individually. Um, yeah, so I've got, so the, these are the sort of, the, uh, oops, sorry, uh, the Joubert, I don't know if you can uh, see it clearly. At all, it's probably too far, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, and uh, the last time I spoke to you about uh, shaped watches, you mentioned um, how case makers have been like, you know, the forgotten heroes in watchmaking and um, most, most of us keep talking about designers, but not so much about case makers. I just feel that not enough credit has been given to them. And, and remember the, sort of the background to it is that it, from the end of the war till I don't know, 1965, all, all these brands bought case, primarily bought cases, you know, from independent case makers who came along and sold them six cases or 12 cases. And, and these same cases you also see featured across uh, different brands and stuff because basically they were, you know, being sold to them. Uh, and, and, and other than a sort of little dainty mark in, in the inside of the case, there is no sort of legacy to them, I feel. I mean, there are one or two people who have started work on identifying who they are. And yes, you can Google and find sort of names and, you know, where in the valleys they were located. But other than that, there's I mean, who these who these incredible individuals were. And uh, I think that's something which uh, someone needs to dig up and share with the rest of the community. And I think that's that's wonderful. Yes, absolutely. I, I just feel they're the unrecognized sort of uh, creators and of, of incredible art. So talking of fascinating cases, I love the reference 2546, uh, the Markowski dial that you have, which is carved out of uh, a single block of gold. Yeah. So can you tell what hunt story behind it? I believe there is one interesting story yeah. to it. That, that, that's the watch. I don't know if you so you probably be able to put up a better image. Um, so basically, I, I have two of them, one in rose gold and one in yellow gold. So the yellow gold, I mean, like you see a lot of lovely watches in the, in the books or perhaps at auction catalogs. And this, I think, has only come up once at auction. I think it was in the late, early 90s or something. And, 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 and they're sort of nutcases like myself, who when you see something like this once, you keep dreaming about it, and you know, it keeps appearing in your dreams and stuff. And, and in the early days of the internet, are they, what's it? Um, you know, one's, one's always scouring the internet for it. And you know, it obviously never came. And the, in those days, you had forums. So I'd keep posting in the forum. I think, in fact, I met someone yesterday uh, and he says oh i used to look at your post forum in the in the 90s and two I, I remember that name i said well you must have got fed up with seeing uh the, these wretched posts wanted 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 but uh yeah so this came up and then one day it was i was actually at home in uganda and and i saw it come up I, it was, someone emailed me i think it's from the forums it was this french dealer living in hong kong and he said he had one and it was uh, he had all the original papers from Bayer. It was he he bought it from someone in Indonesia who was the original collector and and I just got on the phone as soon as I thought it was the appropriate time in Hong Kong uh, and I paid a lot of money I couldn't I don't think I could afford it then but I had to have it I knew this is something that will come up once in my lifetime uh, I've got to get it and in that condition and stuff yeah so that's the story of that one and the second one is in rose gold. and that was with this small time watchmaker I don't know if any those of your listeners or viewers rather who know there's a little antiques market um, near Oxford City called Gray's Antique Market, these little, little stalls. And there was this Polish watchmaker there who's very good. He's now, I think they've squeezed him out of rent and he's moved away. But he said, he showed me, he, he had one of his customers who had the one in rose gold. And he says, I said, I've got to see it. So I did this sort of flirtation of going and inquiring about it went on for like, six, seven years. And this is the fun of it. And, uh, you know, in these, and he wanted know, a crazy sum of money um, for it. And every time I'd go to London, I'd sort of visit him. I said, has the guy changed his mind? Will he come down to earth? And he never did. And, and then one fine day, about two, three years ago, like three years ago, I, I, it came out the same watch was at Phillips. Um, and I put in a bid and it was half the price of what this guy wanted. And I got the watch. So I have two of them. So I'm very lucky with that. That's amazing. <laughs> Nice. And um, we've seen a lot of um, Gilbert Alberts that, that were made while he was at Pate, but you have got one piece that he did post his tenure uh, with the brand. And um, how did you get yeah, over so, that? I mean, he went on to be a, a, well, he, he went on to be a successful jeweler. And I think he has, he has I know he has a boutique, uh, he obviously has a boutique in Geneva, I think in New York uh, and elsewhere. And it's primarily jewelry, but he flirted with uh, watches as well of it, w w on his own whilst he was on his own um, yeah and uh, so I, I again on, on, I saw it on Instagram uh, as a French sort of antiques dealer and I said I've got to have it and then I did some homework subsequent to that 
And he made about six or eight of these absolutely whimsical watches. Um, I, I, well, for me, it, it works on my wrist. And so a lot of people might say, oh, it's a lady's watch. Well, I, I don't give a shit. But you know, for me, I like it and I'll wear it. And I, mean, and I wanted it and I got it. Um, so, yeah, so he, he made about eight of them. And, and I think they're so wacky and crazy and I love it. And, and, and the other story about Gujarberba is basically, so he passed away last year. And I thought it would be a nice touch about three, four years ago to get him to sign my extracts uh, for the ones I have. And so I wrote to him in the old fashioned way of writing a formal letter and stuff. And two months later, I got a reply saying, well, I'm not too sure. And I have to check with Monsieur Stern, whatever, whatever. I said, OK, well, you know, go ahead and check with him. I don't know why he has to check to sign a, an extract for my watches. But anyway, this is the process of the Swiss, I guess. Um, and uh, sure enough, I eventually, a few months later, got uh, got the extra. And I think it's such a lovely sort of touch and to get with his visiting card and stuff. But these these are cool things. Which again, I think a lot of people say it's such a, this is too sort of wacky and nutcasey. But I enjoy it and it gives me pleasure, and that's the fun of it. I think uh, I can go on talking about uh, the special cases and watches with uh, you know. Uh, intricate lugs that you have in your collection but one particular watch that i love is the uh Vashro cornucopia can you can you tell us about it um how did you get it and what's the story uh, again it, it, the watch i've seen i mean it, it's not it's not sort of common but it's not rare either but i think what's rare is the maltese cross within the dial uh that particular watch i think i don't know how many there are. you know you think you know how many of watches there are in vintage and you suddenly see on instagram no you're you think you have something unique, and it ain't unique. Uh, it's uh, anyway, that's part of the learning curve, I guess. So th this is one of these. As I got this watch uh, recent, not too long ago, but from uh, one of these Ferrari loving collector Italian dealers. <laughs> so I paid a lot of money, but I had to have it. So nice. Uh, so I, I think we can move to the next segment with uh, Sumit. Ronnie, I wanted to introduce you to my dog because I know your daughter makes Hi. a beautiful collar. I, I, I see him all, I see, I, I see him all the time. She's so cute. Yeah. This is Bandit. And I want to also mention to everyone that Ronnie's daughter makes this incredible uh, collection of collars with beautiful, like, a beading on them. I want to shout that out because I, I really love what she does. It's, it's absolutely stunning. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Boy. I really appreciate the support. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you later and we'll, just, we'll get you a, a comment. So I guess there's one, be one cool. question before we turn it over to some of the photographs. Uh, why Gilbert Albert? Is there like, you know, it's amazing that you had a correspondence with him, but was there something about his work when you first saw it? You're like, oh my God, it's, it's just so creative. It's breathtaking. I first got a watch catalog from my father-in-law. Uh, father this is in, I don't know, 89 or something. Um, and I got married too young, at like 21 or something. So well, that's besides the point. But um, so, you know, when at that age, you don't have the money and stuff. And you're looking through and there was the, the, the first one I bought, actually. I saw it then. And then you drool over it for years and years. And when you have the means and, you know, eventually got it. But I think it was just seeing it first. But as, as I said to Neha, I think there's so many. Yes, he was perhaps the most recognized of being the most creative for Pare Philippe, but I think there's so many unrecognized heroes of, you know, in terms of watch case design and, and you know, who also deserve the credit. But yeah, um, that's, that's my rationale or reason for admiring him so much. So I totally agree with you, and you're absolutely right that the story needs to be written and research needs to be done on these extraordinary case makers as well, who in some ways, you know, set the, the creative temp temperature for the, that entire period of like really um, elegant watches, but was so such a mesmerizing creativity. And so we will accept that challenge. Miha in particular, <laughs> and myself and Sumit will <laughs> endeavor to put together a body of knowledge about who these people were, the cases, the iconic cases. I look forward to that. Yes. Awesome. And, and uh, so, Ronnie, you know, um, you have some beautiful, whimsical watches in, in your collection and of supreme elegance. And then you've got watches that for any paddock phonograph collector, uh, when they look at it. So I always find it funny because um, like, it, it, I know those watches have tachymeters, but if they had pulse meters, you would have to stop them after a couple of seconds because uh, the heartbeat would be at 200 like uh, you know, <laughs> per minute. Um, and so I would ask you, uh, you've got in particular two watches, both of which are Bourguignon uh, 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 23, Le Mans 2310 based chronographs. One of them is, of course, the 5004, which is 
you know, the probably the most coveted uh, perpetual calendar for second chronograph on the planet. And you've got one with full brigade numerals, which, you know, again, I can't even look at too long because I feel my heart will get weak. Uh, <laughs> and, and, then, and then you've got also a stunning 3970, which is an amazing champion dial with a brigade 12 on it. So I'm going to turn it over to Sumit now because I know he's got questions for you about those watches. I want to really start with the 3970, if you don't mind. Champagne dials, I think the only time that I've seen a champagne dial on a, on a chrono, uh, on a Pat Philippe uh, Perp Cal chrono was, was a 2499 that, that came through Philips not too long ago. Um, they're, they're, they're unbelievable, but particularly with, uh, with the case of the 3970 with those, with those stepped lugs and all, I really wonder how did you come across this this special creation? So if if you look carefully at this watch, uh, at the six o'clock is the initials of the former owner, uh, who's uh, Mike yeah. Ovitz. Yeah, yeah Ovitz. Oh gosh, thank you, thank you for my. That's so all right. It, so it's basically Ovitz's watch. Um, he there were four in this series of of all Breguet numbers, uh, and I came across the, and the dealer was actually Bob Marin. Um, it was at a at, at a watch show, um, and I wasn't out there to buy that particular day. And uh, this was, you know, for for me a big sort of a big fortune. But when I saw it, then choice was uh, an all uh, this, but in black or or this. And I saw it in the show, and of course, you know, Bob's got his style of working. And when in the show, there's like hundreds of people around him and uh, stuff. But when when I saw it all sealed up, and said I, I've got to have you know have this and. You know how things are at shows and with uh, with prominent uh, dealers. Like you've got to sort of make your mind up quickly, quickly. And uh, I was in New York, uh, my first uh, one of such watch shows with primarily with dealers and stuff. And, and I thought, well, I don't have the money to pay for it outright, so I had to hawk and pedal <laughs> about six watches <laughs> to be able to afford it. Um, and I felt bad. Uh, that, so that's, that, 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 that was the background too. And, and a funny story related to that. So one, one of the work I did was that I exchanged for this was the regular demand for it. And, and when I walked into the Palais showroom in London about a year ago, they, they sort of looked at me and said, oh, you've sold it. You know, like I've betrayed them because I got given an, a regular. So obviously someone's watching it there. And but at that time, I, I sort of well, when I got this watch, I sent an email quickly. I said, "Look, I've had to trade uh, some of my precious watches, which I got from you, but it's to get one of yours. Your so I haven't betrayed you." So I, when so a year later, when I walked in, I sort of reminded them, and I said, "I did send an email, by the way." So don't excommunicate me from the high command of um, being granted <laughs> special watches. <laughs> so I think I was forgiven. So that, that so that's a sort of double story to that watch. We might take a step back, Ronnie, and ask you, you know, because uh, the majority of the watches that seem to make up your collection, they are primarily time only watches, but with extraordinary cases. Here, though, is is a very complicated piece of uh, of timepiece. Um, where do you stand on your on your preference for it, and and why did the Perpcal? Uh, a chronographs. Uh, why is the perp cal chronograph something that appeals to you in that regard? Okay, uh, in, in my in my sort of watch, my little watch brain, uh, I uh, I see sort of the classics like the fifteen eighteen, the twenty four ninety nine, um, and so on. And and I think unfor unfortunately, those are sort of beyond my means to acquire and stuff. So the next category, which has been in my lifetime and available like the 5001 the 3970 were a, a, a sort of a, almost like a deck of cards as i see it so it's the 3970 3940 5004 uh, and the 3974 repeater so that that forms a sort of the, the pack of cards for this series in my mind um in terms of why this and not um design driven cases and stuff uh, I, I, you know they're probably uh, just took it to another level. I mean, the 5004, I went on a dog and pony show with Parek to Geneva. And obviously, there you are with surrounded by these big customers and they're all ordering fancy things and stuff. And I just put it out. This was to Ed Butlin, who's the director, a lovely guy. And, and I, 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 you know, I'm just, I'm not just plugging them and say, but genuinely amazing people. You know, there, there's a relationship. And, you know, when you go, I go there to change straps and not buy watches, but they're still 
uh, humble me and you know listen to me and talk. Whereas the rest of you, they look at you and throw you out of their showroom. So this is just a time waster who's going to take up an hour over a strap and drink our expresses. But um, so and and I asked Ed, you know, my dream would be a five zero zero four with this this this, and he said, leave it to me, leave it with me. And sure enough, uh, I don't know, six eight months ago, he said uh, it's possible. And I thought, oh my god. Then I thought, how am I going to pay for this? <laughs> Do I take a mortgage out? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so Maybe I, I, a kidney I or two. Go, oh, so, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was the story. Yeah. But, but, but I mean, yeah. But, but the, like the, the function of the crown, it doesn't really interest me. Other than waiting uh, in sort of offices of African ministers for an appointment where they're like ten hours late. I see no value in the chronograph. You know, you can stare at it whilst you're waiting. But uh, no, otherwise, it's not really of use to me. Um, the well, best stuff, yes, of course. Maybe not so much for the complication, but clearly you are a man for details. Uh, and, and it's possibly, if, if I may suggest, would it be the fact that this is one of four of a kind and the fact that it's, it's not just a 3970, but it's, it's a 3970 with loomed hands and loomed out our plots? Is that... Is that something that is? Yeah, that- uh, I, I, I think I, I think that's the rationale that underpins. All, I think all the watches I play is that I, you know, I do sort of bathe in sort of uh, I don't know what the right word is. When when you go out, I mean, I like to be the only, the, hopefully, the only one wearing a similar watch. I don't want to be, you know, going out for dinner and there's ten people wearing a Nautilus or something. It doesn't interest me, and not only doesn't interest me, but I like I, the uniqueness. Of ha- the ability to have something that's unique is, I think, part of the attraction. I think for me, so yes, uh, you know that that that's part of the calling, for sure. Yeah. The, so those watches are incredible. So let me, just to get this straight, so the the Champagne Dial Brigade Twelve um, Thirty Nine Seventy, that's from the Mike Ovitz uh, watches that were made, which I think there was also like a rose gold black dial version of that. And yeah, am I correct? Uh, I know for sure there was the black one, which. Which was available at the same time. I don't know um, about the other two, to be honest. Okay, but the but the five zero zero four was a um, was a, a special order, though. Yeah, that that was me unique, uh, sort of saying I, I would like this, 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 and uh, the high command coming back and saying yes, your wishes are the genie saying it's been granted. So, Ronnie, because I I sometimes when I, I fantasize about like watches. I have that exact same fantasy, right? Like yours is a reality, <laughs> but mine is like, and then, you know, one day, uh, you know, like Derry Stern will be like, hey, wait, you know, you're, you're not a bad guy. If, if you wanted to watch it, <laughs> I would be like, I would like a brigade numero, like 5004, please. You know, uh, <laughs> and, and, and then he'd be like, okay, let's see what's possible. Uh, and then for that to actually happen, like for, like for me to get the nod of affirmation, I think I would just I would I would be so emotionally overwhelmed I, I wouldn't even know how to react right so so tell me for you that moment when you were told okay we're going to do this for you how did you feel I, I couldn't believe it. I was in absolute shock and disbelief you know this is something what people dream I I dreamt of it and you know you you'd never think in your lifetime you'll get something like this and it, it was it was a big shock and it took a day or two and then I I, I even emailed Ed and. I, I said, if you're a woman, I'd, I'd kiss you, you know, but, you know, I'm, thank you so much. You know? <laughs> I don't think that, you know, that with, that, with, with the formality of Patek, I don't think they expect something like that from a customer. Uh, you, know. Uh, you know, like, because uh, my, my collection is nowhere any, uh, anything close to what you have, but I had a similar experience when, you know, when they did the, the end of series yellow gold 5970s with the, um, those, the bronze dials. And, um, yeah. I saw Nick Fouts uh, wearing one, and then I said, "Well, where'd you get this watch from?" And he said, "Oh, it's a, it's an end of series." So then I I, um, I emailed or no, I messaged Patrick Kramer, you know, uh, in Geneva, and I was like, "Patrick, do you think this is possible?" And he said, "You know, let me ask there." Uh, and then uh, and I didn't hear anything for like I think a year and a half, right? And then, and then like a year and a half later, they I got this message, and it was like a WhatsApp from Patrick when when it was during that period where like. When I used to travel a lot, so I was super jet lagged, and I was trying to sleep. And you know, I'd taken an Ambien and was listening to someone chanting and making like, whales in the ocean. You know, some guy in the <laughs> ukulele playing the Rainbow Connection. And then, and then uh, I got this the WhatsApp that said, 
um, Terry Stearns uh, allocated the last one to you. And I kid you not, I jumped up, uh, 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 started running around the house, pulled champagne out of my fridge and sprayed it to my dog, sprayed it to my wife, who's not my, <laughs> not my ex-wife, so I don't, and I, you know, but, but I sprayed it on myself. Uh, and it was, I was so overwhelmed with also just the acknowledgement of like, hey, you know, we know who you are and we like you. Right, like that. No, was that, that 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 means it's 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 such a overwhelming thing. I think really, you know, and when when these sort of brands sort of talk to you as an individual, and and and, and I think the same, um, the the fact that, for example, Cartier are entertaining me by you know doing things for me. I, I you know I'm in awe. I can't believe it. It's just you know disbelief and stuff. So, absolutely, because you just think to yourself that. You're not. I, I, I'm certainly don't, not a big spender by in relation to what I see uh, and stuff. And and the fact that they you know they know of your existence, kind of thing. That's uh, that's an awesome thing. I think. So this is a very natural segue into one of my favorite subjects, and I know one of your favorite subjects as well, which is Cartier, right? So it was quite funny also because I, I think now, especially that Cartier has grown so much in popularity and also in terms of residual values for the in the secondary market, everyone's after really. You know, cool Cartier watches, whether that be normal watches or limited edition watches, like the Tonsin Clay that was done in the beginning of this year, or the you know the special order watches, like I know you have quite a few of as well. And it was funny because I was asking uh, someone from Cartier, like, what is it that that you look out for in terms of clients for these type of watches? And they said, listen, I'm sure there's many different factors, but one thing that is consistent is we really like it when you're really passionate about the brand and you have knowledge about the brand and you you know are able to 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 express that knowledge in a very articulate way. And I was like, okay, that's kind of cool. Um, and and so uh, I have kind of a, a Cartier special order novice. Um, I have all of one watch, uh, which is the Tonsin Clay with the salmon dial. But you know, it's when I, it, oh, thank you so much, Ronnie. I mean, that means so much coming from you. But I, I would love to talk to you about your love for Cartier. And I would love to talk to you also about a couple of watches, which I think the, the world of social media also is very much in love with. So maybe let's start with the crash because you have, I think, what is the most famous crash uh, in the world. Um, so tell us a bit about the story of that watch, the personal story in terms of how you acquired it, but also what that watch means to you in terms of a symbol of the creativity that Cartier uh, wields so beautifully. Well, f first of all, the, the the brand itself for me, it, it it always has stood for design. I mean, you know, you, I, I know they had this sort of poke in the dark and this uh, walk in the woods. And this flirtation with which went horribly wrong, but uh, it wasn't. It just wasn't them. And, and whoever I knew who worked for them, and I said, and they said, "Ah, oh, we know, but you know, it's the decisions made wherever, wherever, and there's nothing we can do." But that that aside, I mean, you look at the, the lovely books there are, and there's so many books on Cartier that every single watch from the past to me oozes design, and it's so beautiful. I mean, they really are beautiful pieces. So. Uh, the, you know the, the brand and that that association is uh, at another level. I think really it really is. Um, and having said that, I mean it, it's something that if you are into design, then the, it's natural that connection is made um, with the brand. I think it, it's uh, it's associated. So in terms of uh, to answer your question and not ramble on too much, in terms of the um, crash, I mean I, I got wind of the London boutique edition. So obviously I signed up, and I think I was number three or something. Um, so I managed to get the, the, the regular yellow gold, which in itself is a lovely piece and stuff. Um, Amazing one. And then I sort of made contact with the, with the lady uh, uh, in London, uh, who, who sort of is my relationship manager, uh, Philippa. Again, absolutely amazing person. It's, it's incredible how one person from within can make an experience for any, anyone, I think. You know, it's, it really makes such a difference. And, and I think the brands, they spend tons of money on celebrities and stuff like that. But if they focus on building individual relationships, and, and I think this is what historically the brand stood for. I mean, I remember the guy I dealt with in the, in the 2090 who did my first custom one. This is before pre Richemont. And they used to take watches, and I think they started doing this during lockdown, to people's houses, not what jewelry and stuff, to customers' houses and stuff. And, and that's the relationship. You know that one. It, once it, that's created, it, it, you can't go wrong. I think you know, and and, I, and I'm amazed. Like today, and I don't mean to knock the brand, but 
you know, you, you whoever the top bosses are, no, at that level, no one reaches out or anything. Yes, you read of them and see posts at polo matches and stuff like that. But but the people who are actually spending their money are not just buying watches or something, but jewelry. So I, I don't know what that relationship is. And in my business, you know, and I keep telling all my guys, whether I'm selling boxes or what, whatever it is, products I make in Africa, it's all about the relationship at the end of the day. You know, and, and whoever, and, and I, I value, so humility is the biggest attribute I value in an individual. Uh, and I think that that has to be come, come across, you know, the arrogance can't work anymore. I, I love that. You know, you know it's interesting because I, I oftentimes use this um, uh, a story as well, but, you know, Pope Francis, who, who I have to say, you know, uh, despite the sort of many ups and downs as any Pope has had, is in general kind of a cool Pope, right? And, and uh, yeah. I remember when he, uh, when he became the Pope, he, he went on this sort of like endless sojourn around the world, meeting everyone, shaking hands with everyone, kissing babies, you know, high-fiving people. And, and after all of this, after this sort of year-long like, uh, sort of like a journey, um, someone asked him, like, so Pope Francis, what was that all about? And he said, it's very simple. The um, age of authority is over and the age of persuasion has begun, meaning that he is the father of the, the Roman Catholic um, Church knows that he has to go and meet people and win them over individually. That's a very important lesson to also the luxury world. That having been said, I, I think that the current uh, CEO of Cartier is also a pretty remarkable guy because he is, um, he, he's, he's, he's to me one of the most evolved leaders in luxury in general, serial veneral. You know, he, he's, it, it's important for him to, to bring ethics into play with, you know, solar powered watches, but he has also made, um, all of, you know, I mean, I, you were talking about the sort of like a uh, sort of foray into the dark um, as well. He was a guy who had to bring the brand back from that. And he did it with such amazing power that, you know, Nick Fox and I used to joke all the time that they should bring CPCP back. But he actually did something even better. He made the whole brand CPCP in some ways. Right. Yeah, and, 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 you know, to accept to accept the mistakes of the past and, and to pick up the pieces that that takes a lot in an individual. I, I know so many people who just. You know, they, they feel they're so above everything and, you know, it'll fix itself and stuff. And it, it never does. And to right. have the, you know, to, to have the humility, I think, again, to, you know, to accept something was wrong and, and start again. You know, it, it yeah. makes that, that take something. So I want to ask you about the iconography of your amazing Tom Sinclair or two Tom Sinclair's that were just posted. I think uh, someone had a picture. Well, actually, it was a picture that was so amazing because it was a crash of Tom Sinclair and the symmetric together, all of which are thematically connected in terms of colorway that I'm like, I got to stop looking at this stuff. It's just going to make me. <laughs> but um, so the iconography that I see for your Tom Sinclair's um, reminds me a lot of the, of, of the, of the Cartier London era, right? I wonder, was that something absolutely. that was was that your inspiration? If you don't mind my asking. Yes, absolutely. Uh, they they did some, and I and I've got a few in the pipeline where they've gone beyond that, and and actually, I've I've been able to express myself in uh, away from the sort of obviously one of the processes of having um, uh, a, a unique piece is that it has to conform to the brand DNA, um, you know, so. There has to be some kind of reference, I think, to the past. Otherwise, the, the whoever the bod who signs it off will probably shoot it down, and you only have three goes with each submission. And that process is probably a couple of years or a year or whatever. Uh, so I think you, you, I, one, my advice to those um, who wish to get one done is, is, you know, try and do something um, that that's connected to the DNA of the brand intrinsically. Um, because you can do wacky things and stuff, and it'll just waste everyone's time. It's frustrating for you and for them, I'm sure, as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I've got some coming along, and I, I look forward to sharing those, which are different. Uh, I think they do have a bit of the flavor from the past, like you could mention the other two uh, were based on uh, London in the 60, late 60s and 70s. But um, the, 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 the others are sort of a little bit different as well. So I'm, I'm, uh, I cannot I'm wait. I, I'm excited too, Ronnie. They're not even my watches. I just want to see them. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, what I, I love about our hobby is that um, knowledge is power, right? So the more that you learn about a brand, the more you learn about its history, its nuances, the more you can empower yourself in terms of designing something for the uh, today, if you were given the opportunity to design something contemporary. 
Uh, and, but the more it, it sort of informs your appreciation. So, for example, with your amazing 5004 with the Brigade numerals, I mean, you know, we look at that and we think of, you know, reference 130s or we, we think of reference 1463s. Um, or even the second versions of that, the 1563 with the Brigade numerals, and we know those are the most collectible versions of those watches, right? And so when we see that that dial on your watch as well, we're like, oh my God, you know, that's that's that is the dial to have. And then when we and I looked at the uh, your Tonsin plays as well with like the, the London um, inspired dials without the Chemin de Fer with these beautiful bold elongated like uh, Roman numerals, but also you know with your own distinctive touch because there's a lot of creativity there as well. You know, um, I, I absolutely love the amount of research that goes into there. How fun is it for you when you're designing a piece to really go into the research? I love it. I mean, I, I think that's part of the process, and and I think that in one's mind that substantiates. The desire to want something, and 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 you know, it, it it everything has to start somewhere in one's mind, and I think if that that process of research is fundamental to arriving at something that you come to appreciate and value, I think. Absolutely, I you know I look at this. Bit, it sounds a bit wishy washy, but I think you get the gist of what I'm saying. <laughs> I, I completely get the gist. So. Uh, we have 10 minutes left, so I, I think each of us will now ask you a question. So my question is for you. Um, I was wondering over the course of the last year, what have you been, you've been interested in? I, I, I hear that you've been purchasing some very entertaining Universal Genève watches, is that correct? Uh, yeah, I mean, basically during lockdown, I, I, what's happened is that to find the quality and watches of the genre, like I, of the brands I collect, um, at the pricing that I can afford, it's become very, very difficult. Um, the watches are limited in supply, you know, you know who has them and they ain't going to sell them like I ain't going to sell them. So I, I ventured beyond to see, and there's so many beautiful watches and you don't have to, you know, own a fortune to be able to afford them. So yes, Universal has been one of the brands I've looked at, uh, Longines uh, and stuff. So yeah, there's lots and lots of beautiful timepieces. And this is, I think one of the things I get, the fun I get out of Instagram is I get a lot of people direct mailing, 20, 30 people a day. And asking for thoughts and advice and stuff. And I said, look, go where your heart is. You don't have to spend tons and tons. And, you know, I get a lot of kids who said, you know, they're just at university. Well, you shouldn't be buying watches anyway. You should get your house first and stuff. So, you know, the watches will always be there. Uh, it's just dumb to spend money on watches. You can, that's at a later time in life. But, um, you know, the, but you can still pick up nice watches for, you know, hundreds of dollars. Not, not You don't have to spend thousands. But. And uh, Ronnie, am I correct that you've actually even purchased watches on eBay? Oh yeah, of course. We all did. Uh, in the beginning, I could I could only afford watches for two or three hundred dollars. So I've still got uh, a few of them, and I still do look. Um, I think what's happened is that with social media evolving, eBay sort of been become the sort of the 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 sink trap um, of watch sellers. So whatever is not sold anywhere seems to end up on eBay in terms of quality and stuff. So, but whereas before. Uh, you could find it. And I think still occasionally, you, you know, what we all dream of, that sort of dream of single owner families watch <laughs> it on. <laughs> there are many single owners out there, but um, yeah, so occasionally I think you can find. So yeah, and I still do look, absolutely. I have no shame or no guilt in saying uh, I do buy on eBay <laughs> watches. Great place to look, you know, because again, it's also, it, it values your, your knowledge and it values your ambition and uh, discipline as a hunter. Um, okay, Miha, what is your last question for Rani? I'm most fascinated with the Audima PV collection uh, that you have and uh, dials that we've not seen before anywhere, which includes um, uh, a, a, a fire studded uh, bezel. And uh, there's one um, yeah, which um, I'm, I, I think it, it's double signed, uh, it's signed Van Cleef in Apples. I mean, basically, so, my foray into order my again was based on um, not being able to get the Padex that I so give me such pleasure and stuff. The frustration of it, and this is a this is a brand that I, again I think the more I researched and studied and I looked and saw they have amazing in terms of design, absolutely incredible. Um, it just you know took me off my chair and stuff. And and three four years ago, I said, well, you know, and, and these were affordable watches you could buy. These kind of watches I bought for know, $2,000 to $5,000, which, yes, I know it's a lot of money, but in terms of watches, that is still pretty reasonable. Um, and I just went crazy, and I think I bought, bought so many of them uh, and stuff, and I think it was the right timing and stuff. And, and But still, there's, there's rarities within them. 
Um, there's very little written about vintage time only AP. They've published a lovely book on uh, on complications. So, but time only, it's it's been way. And you guys, uh, if you want to do some spend some time, please help us and educate us in time only vintage AP. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think uh, you know th- th- there's there's so much there and stuff and but to find stuff that you see the original drawings of and to go on the hunt for it and the, the search for a watch gives me immense sort of pleasure and fun and enjoyment. I think that's a lot of it, almost more than acquire, owning the watch itself. And uh, why don't you tell us a bit more about the bespoke uh, wandering hour watch that you've been working on and when do we get to see it? Okay, so basically the guys who are making it, um, they, they wanted it sort of confidential. So they're the guys who restore vintage watches for Cartier. So the people doing the job, uh, you know, uh, know what they're doing and stuff. Um, the, the, the Wandering Hour watch itself, I saw it in an auction catalog in the mid-90s. It was a small watch. It's not my design or anything. The case I'll talk about. But that particular watch, it was owned by a Turkish fighter pilot in World War I. Uh, but again, I, in terms, I don't know if that auction listing was a bit of bullshit because Robert Carr patented the watch in the 1930s. World War One ended in 1918, so I don't know. Probably the auction house got a bit carried away. But anyway, it's a nice story and good to think uh, to think of it like that. Um, and of course, that auction at that time, I didn't have the money, and a lot of money is probably breaking. It was a the thought for this. Uh, the case, I wanted something a little bit bigger. The, the, I've bought actually another Wandering Hour one, um, but I'll, I'll share that online when I get it. A lot of watches I've been, I've bought are in, in the States and I, I don't have access uh, to them. Um, but going back to, again, I rambled too much. So I'll, going back to this one, the, the thought was, uh, I love the case of the Patek 2552. It's a classic stepped case. Uh, so I, we've used the case of that 36 millimeter in steel uh, taken in a vintage Audemars Piguet movement uh, to arrive at this. Um, in terms of the execution, they're having problems. Obviously, COVID affected the Swiss valleys as well, so they snooze more than they snooze um, and delayed things even more. But uh, hopefully, it will be ready sometime. It's already six or eight months late, but uh, I'm patient. In Africa, we say, if everyone complains about time, we say, you be patient. So I'm, I'm, I'm patient. I know how to be patient. <laughs> so hopefully another couple of months. Ronnie, Great. we have also telling us about a book project that you're working on. Yep. Um, so I've had, again, one of, I've met this whole social media thing has been sort of life-changing in a lot of ways. And my daughter says, you're sad that you know so many people uh, who you've never met and stuff. When you go to cities, you meet them. But I, I think it's cool. Um, so a lot of people have said, well, why don't you, we'd love to, you know, learn more and see what you have and stuff. So I've been, to be honest, I'm just too lazy to, I don't even know what watches I have. So the first thing, my daughter bought me this book where you write down what you have. I I know it all in my head, but I don't have it in writing. So I started doing that and I I need someone to help me, uh, put it together and write the fancy terminology. I could do it, but I'm just lazy uh, and probably get bored very easily. Well, Ronnie, if I can be of any help for you with your book, it would be a pleasure. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. So, yeah, it's it's in the pipeline. I don't know how long it will take and stuff. Um, I want to thank you so much for spending this time with us. I know you have a hard stop in a couple of minutes, um, but we just want to say that, I, 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 you know, again, like on behalf of all of us and on behalf of all the watch collectors out there, uh, it's so wonderful to have people like you in our in our universe to have um, – such an educated, educated and discerning sort of uh, perspective on watch collecting, um, and also to uncover all, and unearth all of these gems that would normally be hidden and obscured to us, and and shine a spotlight on them. I think you are probably the ultimate treasure hunter and also the one of the best educators in the watch. Uh, oh, thank uh, you, too kind, way too kind. But I look, I look forward to meeting all of you in person. Um, I, I don't know if you'll come to Uganda. If you do, it would be a pleasure and you come home and eat with me and all your meals and stuff. Otherwise, we'll meet in London or in New York or in Singapore or Hong Kong, wherever. I hope one day, not to. Absolutely, Ronnie. I think that uh, that our paths must absolutely cross and I'm looking forward to that day. Thank you so much, my friend, and, and wishing you a, a wonderful Take care. day. Yeah. Take care. Thanks, bro. Bye-bye. Say bye, to ba- say bye to Bandit. Bye. See you. Sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, bye guys.